George Lewis. I'm a professor of music at the University of California, San Diego, right up the road there at UCSD. And um, this is my colleague, my senior colleague, the most senior professor in the entire music department, Professor Bertram Turetsky. And um, Bertram Turetsky is one of the finest bass players anywhere in the world, a contrabassist who has had more than 300 compositions written for him. 300 composers have written very major works for him. He's, um, he's established new ways of playing the bass. He plays just about every style you can think of. And uh, he would like to talk this morning about creativity, which is something I think we're all interested in here since we're all trying to be creative on our instruments. And I think Professor Turetsky has a lot to say about that. And he's going to also play some examples of the kinds of music he's known. And we wanted to also talk to him about his life as a performer. So if we could welcome him, that would be great. Thank you. So I wanted to ask you, you wanted to talk about creativity. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? Well, uh, creativity means to me not accepting status quo. In other words, this instrument, uh, yeah, Please. this instrument uh, has a proscribed role usually in orchestras and music, and everybody thinks, well, the bass does just this. So I thought I should be creative and I should look at it in a different way. So, what does the bass do in an orchestra? The bass carries tunes. Do you think it's fun to play? And you violin players and you cellists and viola players play a melody, and all I do is go zoom, 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 zoom. No, I didn't like that. I thought we can do better than that. And the way you do better is reinvent perhaps an instrument, and you say, what else can you do? So you find other ways of, of playing. Symphony orchestras have other things to do. For example, there's an opera Othello, and in the last act there's a murder. And guess who announces musically that there's a murder? Do you know what instrument does it? The No. Me. Listen carefully. That doesn't sound like the birds and the bees announcing the coming of spring, does it? No, that's ominous. So the bass occasionally does that. And um, so we can paint pictures in music, and we can make all kinds of colorations in music. We can play rhythmic things. We can do many things, so we have to look, and we have to figure out things we can do. Now, we live in America, which is a nation that has people from many parts of the world. I call it the salad bowl. We used to call it the melting pot. So listen carefully. Musical instruments are like people. They come in all sizes and all shapes and colors and group together in families. Ladies and gentlemen, they group together in families. Now the other members of the string family are, come on, you know, because you play one. The violin, excellent. Next, Cello. viola, Cello. contrabass. Excellent, so there's a family. So now there's a family of instruments that are like guitars. One of them is called the sitar, and that comes from India. And when I was a young man, and I was a young man once, a few years ago, I heard some Indian musicians play, and they played two instruments at once, so I'll play two instruments at once. Any of you play two instruments at the same time? It's fun. So that's the sound of the tambura. He just plays one note. But then you put the sitar in. So I heard that sound and I said, I can do that on my instrument. I can do anything I really want to do if I work at it. That's part of being creative. You have an idea and you make it work. Getting an idea and just having an idea is not enough. You have to make it work. And you all know about the guitar. It's the most popular instrument all over the world. So what is pizzicato? Anybody know? 
Thank you for volunteering. You don't use your bow to um, And what do you use? You use your fingers. That's right. You pluck the strings gently without hurting them, right? The guitar is played with the fingers, so. guitar sounds in the bass, you have the sitar. Um, some of you know friends who are drummers. Many cultures who use hand drumming. So I thought, without harming the bass, any sound you make on an instrument is legitimate as long as it makes music and you don't harm the instrument. So I worked on some percussion sounds. Listen to the different sounds. Tailpiece. hurting anything, knocking anything down, not hurting the F all over here, being very careful. So you can make an instrument be most anything you want it. To be, you can play. Um, with the bow, you all know that you have uh, several colors. You have the normal sound. <laughs> different color by bringing the bow up to the fingerboard and darkening it and softening it a little bit. Or you can make it sound very glassy and sort of scary. If your younger brothers and sisters were here, they'd be scared. This will sound like Freddy Krueger is coming to visit. But you're, you're older, you're not scared. When I play that for your brothers and sisters, they go, woo! That's called sul ponticello. Can you say that with me? Sul ponticello. Excellent. I so, think that means scary. Absolutely. <laughs> and it means play down near the bridge and it'll sound scary. So that's just a couple of things you can do with the instrument, you know, and just looking at it in a different way. Now, how did you... How did you learn a lot of these techniques? How did you how did you do it? Because did you... This is part of what creativity is. Yes. How did you... Well, I heard a sound in my head. And I said, how can I make that sound? How can I do that? Hmm. And then some people said, well, you don't do that on a bass. And that made me want to do it. <laughs> See, I was one of those students, ladies and gentlemen. I was one. If your teacher said, don't use the third finger, I used it. Otherwise, I was very nice and respectful. But you had, did you have the traditional bass education? What was your background in performing? My, I had the traditional education. I have a degree in the instrument and a degree in music history. And I played in symphony, opera, and ballet orchestras for over 20 years, maybe 30. And uh, I thought that I wanted to do more experimentation. I wanted to develop the instrument more. And so I left the orchestra and I began a career as a soloist chamber music player and a professor of music. Before I was a professor, but I played in the symphony and the opera full time. So as a result, for 15, 20 years, I was never home. I was always playing. Never home, really? Very, oh, I was home enough to have a few children around the way, but you know, <laughs> I was not home too much. So you've played all kinds of music in your yes. career, yes? You've yes. played classical music, That's as we've right. been describing. you played jazz. Yes. I mean, what, is it, what are the differences between the different, from your standpoint as a performer, what does, to play jazz, how is that different from playing um, European classical music? Okay, example? that's a good question. Well, in European classical music, you have stylistic parameters. You're playing Baroque music. There's an approach to playing Baroque music, uh, universally agreed on by most people. Like, what would that sound like, for example? Well, what would you say? You know, let's see. Uh, let me think of something. Yes. <laughs> of a, a sonata by Vivaldi, who was a very famous Baroque composer, and uh, it has a singing style. It's Italian music. All Italian music sings. So I try to play and I heard it that way, and I played it. Changed a few notes. <laughs> but I tried to see how the voice would go when the line goes up. When you sing, 
I did it on the bass. And then romantic music came along, the instruments got bigger, they, they put um, bass bars in, the instruments got l louder because the holes were bigger, and they played in a bigger style. They would play... It's a big, full sound, because you had to reach out in a big hall. Before, you played for the nobility, the kings, the queens, the princesses, and all that. And it was a smaller room, maybe like this. And they would invite their friends and their neighbors and all that. And that was easier. The instruments were soft. The string instruments were softer. They had gut strings. These have steel strings. And the sound is bigger. Western music got louder and louder until today it's amplified. And you probably have a 10% hearing loss already if you go to rock concerts all the time. Now, how does, no, then the Western music changed after a while, and there was this sort of, what would you call it, contemporary music or uh -huh. new music? I yes. mean, how does, that's, that doesn't always sound like the no, that you just played. Well, the, the, um, the so-called new music, people are interested in new sounds and uh, new musical colors. And so everybody was wondering, how can you make something different? They wanted to be original. Every piece had to be original. So, you know from physics, the longer the string, the lower the sound, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So all of a sudden, someone would write a piece for the bass, and it would start... said, that's a bass, we expected, you know, low. All of a sudden we get. So we started looking for new sounds. For example, do you know what culture, an instrument called the bazooki comes from? Anybody know? If you ever go to a concert of Greek music, their guitar is called the bazooki, and it's played with a pick, a plectrum, and it sounds like this. So composer heard that, he said, can you do that on the bass, on the cello, on the violin, or the guitar? We, they wanted new sounds, they just didn't want this. They thought this was interesting. They thought maybe this was interesting. That's called Colenio Trotto. Can you say that with me, please? Colenio Trotto. It means you draw the wood of the bow. It's not much fun for the bow, but the bow doesn't talk, so it can't complain. And then there's Colenio Batuta, which is... And so on, using the wood of the bow. Mm -hmm. So that was a new sound. And there's what they call the Bartok pizzicato, which is a, a sound that wakes everybody up. But none of you were sleeping. So you pull the string way up and you whack it. And uh, in the folk culture of Eastern Europe, a lot of people play that way. In early jazz music, they played slap bass. So all of a sudden, in new music, they find some sounds that are so old, ladies and gentlemen, that they're new. <laughs> and we try to we try to find those things and you all these scary sounds then they put it into music because this is a scary world right people have weapons and people drop bombs and all kinds of things so there's sounds that reflect that art reflects the time and in new music we try to find new ways of playing uh, there was a great jazz bass player whose name was Leroy Slam Stewart and he sang with the bow so he would go so that was a unique sound. So then composers said, well, you can use your voice with it. And all of a sudden, you, they wanted the color with or and you're using your voice. And then they made gesture, choreograph, choreographed gesture, because people go to a concert and they look, right? The conductor makes big gestures, or some conductors 
It's less theatrical, very, very nice, lots of wrist. Some of them conduct from their backside and so on and so forth. So there's a visual parameter for all of this. And, and along with these, this whole new world of sound, we play down here sometimes. Sometimes you have pieces where you have to... That can be pretty, pretty scary stuff. But in a context, it's not just a crazy sound. It can, it can sound very beautiful. It can sound uh, engaging. You say, wow, what was that? How did they do that? That's cool. Cool is good. But let's say that you didn't do that, but you're still creative, right? I mean, you don't have to do that to be creative. No, I mean, there's something true. like if you're playing an instrument, if you're trying to make music, there's so many different ways to make music, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. And that's what makes music always uh, creative and always wonderful. You can't get bored if you're a creative player. For example, uh, George, if you have a piece you have to play, and let's say it's a great audience like you, very attentive, attentive you can play it softer. If it's an audience that people are talking, and I'm not, that's not a good audience, you know, if they talk, then maybe you push the sound bigger Maybe if you're nervous, you play a little faster, or you're excited that day. You got an A in music, right? Very good. So you play a little faster. You're always changing it around to make it fresh and make it fun for you. If it's fun for you, it's going to be fun for your audience. Remember that. And play to your audience. It's a good thing. Look at them. If you're playing well, they'll be right with you and that'll make you feel better, it'll give you energy. Instead of like some performers don't even look at them and they just look out there, or they see vegetables. But if you're playing well, the audience feels it and they give you a nice kind of energy. This is a question that I have always wanted to ask you about um, because um, much of the world's music, if not most of it, is made without reading music and, yeah. and by, let's say, improvisation which is also a different kind of discipline, would you say? Yes. And do you also improvise yourself? Yes, I do, in fact. And yeah, I have even improvised with you. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I was supposed to ask you that, but it yes. isn't, we, I confess, we have played music together. And <laughs> it's official. So with improvisation, uh, I find all of a sudden you're into a realm of enormous creativity. You have, as uh, Mrs. Hill said, uh, a vocabulary. Then you develop further the sounds that you hear and you dream of, and then you put them together in real time. Whereas a composer like Beethoven worked 30 years on his Ninth Symphony, incidentally, and we're glad he did because it's a great masterpiece. But all of a sudden you're out there and you're playing for 10 minutes and you've got to make something happen. And that's just a great moment. You're in what Tony Gwynn, the, the, our famous baseball player, calls the zone. Yeah. Everything is working and all the juices are working. Anything you hear, you can play. Any sound, you can play with your bow or your fingers. And that's just a, a wonderful thing. Now, if I gave you three minutes, yes. what could you do with it as an improviser? You want me right, to? right now? You know, like Bird said, said, paint me a picture right now. You got it. You ready? <laughs> yeah.
got your picture. <laughs> Yes. Can you play Flight of the Bumblebee? It sounds like about a 500 pound bumblebee when I play it, so we'll dispense with that. When, when it gets faster, I'll come back and play it for you. There, I know a bass player who played it, but it sounded like it was at least 200 pounds. I'm 500 pounds right now. Yes. Well, what other instruments do you play? I'm going to tell you the truth, or should I make up something? I'll tell you the truth. When I was a little fellow, I played an instrument called the banjo, which is the American instrument. It was named by Thomas Jefferson. And my mother was from Europe, and she thought I should play the violin. And I didn't want to play the violin. So I read Mark Twain's books, and it always talked about people playing the banjo. So occasionally, I take a banjo out. I also play the guitar. And late at night, I play the piano, and I accompany my students on the piano. I'm not ready for prime time on the piano. But this instrument, I've been in prime time for a while. Yes. Please. How old were you when you started playing the bass? Uh, I think 14 or 15. Yes, dear. Um, when you started playing the bass, did you enjoy it? Oh, it, music has been my whole life. They say, what's your religion? I say, music. And music is a way of life. It's not a profession for me. For me. And I love the bass. I have, uh, how at home I have four. And my wife, of many years, knows that I love the bass very much. And uh, we're very happy. Uh, we'll have a 40th wedding anniversary in next month in September. So uh, the, yes, the bass is very important to me. Did you, well, I want to have a question. Because you asked that question, which instrument do you play? The viola. Uh, did you like it right away? Yeah. You did? Yeah. yeah. With love, right? Great. I also like a question, and I wanted to ask if uh, Ms. Uh, Professor Tresky has always, if, if he um, always loved practice as a teenager. Practice? Did you always love practice? No, I didn't love practice. And then someone said to me, practicing is a privilege. Oh. Practicing, practicing is a privilege. <laughs> and uh, I start to think about that. And then one day, uh, my wife came home and said, Dear, I want to talk to you. And she sat me down and she said, We're going to have a baby. I said, We're going to have a baby. And suddenly I began to practice more and more. And then uh, uh, 18 months later, she said, Dear, sit down. And I said, Don't tell me. She said, OK, uh, when? And I, we had another baby. And I practiced more and more. And then one day, we had a daughter. And I practice more and more. And now I, I practice an awful lot, and I love it. I really do, because I work at it creatively, and I have the discipline. And I also must, because my children had to eat, and they had to go to college, and so on and so forth. Now they're all finished. Now, do you practice improvisation, too? Yes, I always improvise every day. Really? I pick up the instrument. I don't think about painting a picture so much. I try to find new things. And I'll, I'll improvise on this part of the bass. Or I'll say, improvise, and all you can do is use the wood of the bow and your fingers. That, and I'll work a couple minutes like that. And then I'll add more, more things to the vocabulary. It's quite disciplined. And my students, some of them do that, and they like it very much. So is the idea that to become a more complete musician, you right. don't stay in one area. That's what you seem to be saying. Yeah. And when I played, uh, last time I played a classical concerto with orchestra, and I have uh, several, uh, uh, I always improvise the cadenzas as they did in the 18th century. And once I got in trouble, I got in the wrong key. Now the cadenza is which part? No. The cadenza is the solo part for the solo instrument, where the orchestra stops and lets you stretch your stuff. It's kind of near the end of the piece. Yeah, often. A big part yeah, of the piece. Yeah. yeah. And I, I did one, and I was really going, you know, I was really... <laughs> player said you're in the wrong key and I said oh my god and I, I did something very fast and I got in the right key and I finished up in a blaze of glory and everybody thought it was wonderful and they they did this and I was soaking wet and I lost 10 pounds I forgot what key I was in because I was improvising you can get lost so if you improvise a lot you don't get lost if you practice a lot and you pay attention you don't get lost if you watch the conductor you don't get lost so concentration creativity discipline, commitment to the instrument, and it'll all end up in a joyous time. You'll have fun. That sounds great. Please. I mean, 
Did you like jump from instrument to instrument before you did the bass? No, I played the banjo and I played in a band, a C and W band. Don't tell anybody. A C and W band. We were called the Arkansas Travelers. We we're all young. All of us had hair, long hair. And then uh, they said, "Well, the banjo is corny, man. If you want to play in the band, you got to play the guitar." So I got a guitar, I took one lesson, and in a couple of months I was ready to play in the band. I, w I worked hard. Yeah, but you really know how to play the guitar. Well, yeah, well of course I did. a long time. Yes. <laughs> and then I wanted to play the bass. I, 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 when I was 16, I met some great jazz musicians, and I began to play the bass, and they invited me to play with them, and they were very kind and very supportive, like all real teachers are. And uh, they said, okay, we're going to play Saturday night over here. You come and you'll sit in. And then I'd come and they'd say, well, listen to this, listen to that, listen to this. That sounds good. And I was very privileged at an early age to play with great musicians in the conservatory without walls, as I call it. So, cool. and then I went on playing different musics, and uh, I, I still have a mixed uh, variety, a big variety of musics I play, and I enjoy it very much. Are there other questions? You, you had a question. Um, um, how long did you play until you were able to play like you can now? Oh, you learn... It, the good news is it takes a whole lifetime to play, and there's no bad news. <laughs> okay? Are there other questions? Yes. Do any of your children play instruments? Um, my son played in a rock band, and they didn't get paid a couple times. <laughs> and he said, Dad, I'm going to go straight, and now he's a, an executive in a big company, and he makes an awful lot of money, and he wears suits. And I call him my son, the suit. And I'm proud of him. And he plays drums once in a while, but not professionally. Okay? Yes? Um, how many different rhythms and tunes do you think you created? Oh, my goodness. I, I have no idea. I, I created some tunes, but rhythms, I, I don't know if I can take credit for anything like that. I've heard a lot of rhythms because I listen to music a lot, and I've played with all kinds of different musicians. So I really don't know. But it's a good question. It's something I'll think about on my way up north. I think we have time for one more. Yes. Do you prefer playing solo, being playing like solo, or do you like playing with an orchestra? I like to play with uh, uh, chamber groups because then we we converse. It's very humane. It's very nice. It's very friendly. And the orchestra sometimes, well, you're told how to play by the conductor. Now, uh, at the end of my orchestra career, I was the principal bass, the first bass. I would tell them how to play, which isn't always pleasant, because they studied, they were talented, and I'd say, excuse me, but we do it this way. And then if the conductor didn't like it, he'd say, no, we do it, you do it my way. That wasn't fun for me. But in chamber music, it's give and take. It's like playing in a team, you know? And that's nice. And if somebody feels excited and they go a little faster, you go with them. And if they make something just so beautiful and they relax it, you do that. And it, it's just wonderful. Interacting with other people is, people talk about communication and music is the highest form of communication. I always thought if the politicians only could play chamber music, the world would be just wonderful. So could we just thank Professor Turetsky for his <laughs> I'll shake your hand. <laughs>